Let's talk about druids, the tree-loving hippies of D&D. But after you've finished smoking up a J with a friendly direwolf, how good is your subclass actually? Let's find out. Circle of Dreams. So the Circle of Dreams druid is basically the fae-themed druid subclass, which is a really cool theme, but it mostly translates in practice to some pretty basic healing abilities. From level 2, you get this sort of quasi-healing word type ability, letting you choose a target within 120 feet and, as a bonus action, heal them for a few d6 plus some temporary hit points. It's kind of like a super healing word, letting you pick up an ally as a bonus action and throw them back into combat. It's a bit boring, but it's really good. Hearth of Moonlight and Shadow sounds like the middle entry in a teen romance novel series, but it is also the Dreams Druid 6th level ability. And just like teen romance book series middle entries, it kind of sucks. It lets you basically hide yourself when you rest at night. Not guaranteed hiding, no, that would be, that would be crazy. No, you just get a plus 5 to stealth checks while you long rest. This is an ability that will see absolutely no use in very many games, and only situational use in others. You don't need to turn into a sheep to know this ability is bad. <laughs> At 10th level, you get the ability to teleport up to 60 feet as a bonus action or teleport an ally up to 30 feet. It's sort of like an upgraded Misty Step, and it is good, but for a 10th level ability, it's kind of mid. But don't worry, level 14 is here, and I'm sure it's the powerhouse combat option we've all been waiting for. You can now cast Dream, Scrying, or Teleportation Circle when you finish a short rest. Okay, sure, it's not combat useful, and Dream and Scrying are very situational spells, but Teleportation Circle is great. That is free travel anywhere. Except it actually isn't, because you can only portal to the place you last finished a long rest with this feature. So it is a one-way ticket back to this morning's camp. It's not literally useless in a vacuum, but it is very weak for your 14th level superpower. Dream Druids are, in my opinion, a subclass where the flavor is a bit all over. I mean, yes, you can cast Dream and you can teleport like Fey, but it doesn't really hit the spot. That would be okay, except the abilities are also very mid. The healing is nice, but it's just an upgraded healing word, which all druids get anyway. If you want the whole nighttime ethereal type build, the Twilight Cleric, or another druid subclass we'll get to later, does it much better, in my opinion. Dream druids go in low C tier. Circle of Spores. This is the perfect subclass if you just want to be a fun guy. Things start off looking pretty good. You get some tasty spells like Blindness, Deafness, and Confusion, but can the Last of Us Fungal Infection subclass keep it going? Level 2 grabs you Halo of Spores, essentially a roaming, invisible aura of death. Whenever a creature moves within 10 feet of you or starts its turn there, you can order the spores to deal 1d4 necrotic damage to them. This damage increases as you level up, capping out at 1d10. It is not bad for a repeatable reaction. You also get Symbiotic Entity at this level, where you can awaken the spores around you by expending a use of your wild shape. You gain 4 temporary hit points times your druid level, which is actually a pretty thick shield, honestly, and your Halo of Spores feature deals double damage. Even better, your weapon attacks are dealing an additional 1d6 damage on a hit. Slap Shillelagh on your quarterstaff and you are bonking people for 1d8 plus 1d6 per hit using your Wisdom modifier. This is actually really good and it rewards you for being in close range where you can then use your reaction to spore people. It also lasts for 10 minutes so you can set it up before combat. If you can't tell by the amount of time we've spent talking about it, it is really good. In fact, this is the best melee focused druid subclass outside of the subclass that you know is coming. Don't worry, we'll get there. Fungal Infestation is your 6th level feature, and it's cool, but a bit weak. When a small or medium beast or humanoid dies within 10 feet, you can use your reaction to reanimate it as a zombie with only one hit point. It can only attack, and it must use the zombie stat block. Groovy flavor, very Last of Us, but zombies are quite weak, and by this point in the game, medium or smaller beasts are getting very rare to fight. If you want to see a subclass that can really reanimate corpses to control the dead and access their stat blocks, you're going to want to check out the Shinigami Warlock from Ryoko's Guide to the Yokai Realms, pre-order on Bakakit, plug plug. 
Anyway, 10th level gets you spreading spores. You can now sneeze those spores that surround you up to 30 feet away. It functions pretty much the same, dealing damage to creatures in its area, but it no longer requires your reaction. This is a great way to use your halo of spores without directly confronting enemies at close range, and gets especially powerful if you can lock a bunch of enemies in a tight space so they keep taking the damage. Luckily, druids have tons of awesome spells to do that, so this is good. Finally, level 14 brings in the fungal body feature, meaning you cannot be crit unless you are incapacitated and you are immune to the blinded, frightened, poisoned, or stunned conditions? It's deafened. Blinded, deafened, poisoned, and frightened. That's what it is. I mean, yeah, that's, that's good, right? I mean, it's maybe a bit uninspired to just say no to a bunch of conditions, but it's powerful. All in, I really like the Spores Druid. It offers a distinct playstyle different from any other Druid. The flavor is on point, and it's, it's just fun. They can go in 80. Here's a little ditty for Elise by Ludwig van, van Beethoven. But Elise is also the name of this book that's really good. Come take a look. A whole new system to craft your spells and even make combos as well. And by the way, there's also, by the way, there's also four new classes. Scions and summoners, big bad guys' asses, a total of Fresh new subclasses with all new spells, burn foes to ashes, new potion crafting, new races too, all waiting here, waiting for you, inside the book of magic, inside the book of magic, all the Elise's Guide to Magic is out now on Kickstarter, a full 5e supplement with craftable magic. Create spells spontaneously by pulling from your environment in a dynamic, creative system to kick ass. Also, four new classes, 19 subclasses, potion, poison, and item crafting, and dragons, baby! That's Elise's Guide to Magic, link below, grab yours today! Circle of Stars. Hey now, you're a Circle of Stars. Get your game on, go play, with maybe the most flavorful second level druid feature in the game. You have created a star map, which is basically just a flavorful way of saying, here's a thing, you can use it as your spellcasting focus. You also have the Guidance Cantrip and the Spell Guiding Bolt, which you can cast without a spell slot a number of times equal to your proficiency bonus. Guiding Bolt is a pretty dope spell, to be fair. A few free castings of a 4d6 blast with upside is not to be sniffed at. Your other feature is Starry Form. As a bonus action, you can use your wild shape to adopt a starry form. You shine bright light in a 10 foot radius and it lasts for 10 minutes. And you pick from three forms when you do this, chalice, archer, and dragon. Archer is great, letting you blast out a chest cannon of 1d8 damage plus your wisdom modifier as a bonus action every turn. Damage is damage. Chalice is the healing one, letting you heal an additional creature within 30 feet of you when you cast a healing spell. Dragon is the coolest, but also probably the most situational. It just says that any roll you make on a wisdom or intelligence check or concentration saving throw cannot be lower than a 10. To be honest, most of the time you're going to want to be the archer, but having the options is nice. Sixth level gets you Cosmic Omen, which is a bit like the Bard's Cutting Words. At the end of every long rest, you roll roll a die. If the result on the die is odd, you get the woe ability. If it is even, you get wheel. If you have a d1, you can guarantee that you get woe every single time. What is a d1, you ask? It's this. It's a tennis ball with the number one written on it. Wheel lets you use your reaction to add 1d6 to a creature's attack roll, ability check, or saving throw. Woe is the same, but it subtracts 1d6. And both of these are good, but Woe is probably better because forcing a failed saving throw is probably more powerful than letting a creature pass one. Tenth level just improves your starry forms. Now you can fly and hover, or you deal extra damage or more healing. It's simple but effective, and you can now change forms without an action at the start of your turn. Finally, you get full of stars at level 14. Like the Spores Druid, it is a simple defensive feature. You now resist bludgeoning, slashing, and piercing damage, which is really good. All in, stars is a great subclass. Great flavor, great versatility, great damage, great healing. It does everything it needs to do. 
it goes in S tier. Circle of Wildfire. For my critical role season three broskies, we have the Circle of Wildfire. Yet another druid subclass that throws the wild shape feature right in the trash to do something cool instead. In this case, summon a wildfire spirit. Its AC and HP are kind of low, but it flies and has this mass teleportation feature that can get you and allies out of an immediately threatening situation or a grapple, which is very nice. You also get some bonus fiery spells, which weirdly doesn't include fireball, but there's enough stuff here to keep the average arsonist pretty happy. At 6th level, the spirit also boosts your fire damage or healing spells by 1d8, which is actually pretty good. That's a pretty big buff to your firebolt cantrip. You can also cause your spells to originate from it, not from you, which is really good for healing allies that you can't see or attacking from behind cover from your spirit in the air. Level 10 is Cauterizing Flames, which is an ability that's worded in a weirdly complicated way, but it basically translates to 2d10 plus your wisdom modifier of damage or healing that you can do after a creature dies. It's okay. It's definitely one of those abilities that's a lot more fancy than it is actually powerful. Finally, at level 14, you get the now traditional Druid Defensive feature. When you fall to zero hit points while your spirit is within 120 feet, you can cause it to fall to zero hit points instead, and you regain hit points until you're at half your maximum. That's some pretty big healing, especially for a druid subclass that likes to get into combat, but it does require you throwing your pet under a bus. If you can live with that, Go nuts. It's also one of those abilities that does literally nothing if you never get knocked down. You might as well not have this ability if you play sensibly. <laughs> Wildfire Druids are decent. They are limited in the sense that fire damage is really limited. There are tons of creatures that resist or are immune to your main damaging spells, but they come with a cool pet that flies. They go in high B tier. Circle of the Land. This is the basic baby of subclasses, the champion fighter of druids, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be bad. At level two, you get an extra cantrip, which is cool, and you can recover a few spell slots when you finish a short rest. You are the most wizardly druid around at this point. That's good because you get some very solid bonus spells depending on the terrain you choose to specialize in. There's options like hold person, haste, mirror image, and greater invisibility. You just pick the option that works best for you. Sixth level is a bit more situational. It basically lets you ignore difficult terrain and have advantage on saving throws to resist being restrained, but specifically by plants and vegetation. Honestly, unless you really build around this feature, it's probably not going to see much use. Tenth level has kind of the same vibe. You can't be charmed or frightened by elementals or fey, and you're immune to poison and disease. Immunity to poison damage is nice, but honestly, I think you could just be immune to the charmed and frightened conditions full stop, and, and this feature would be totally fine. It wouldn't be broken. As it is, this relies on you specifically fighting those types of creatures for this feature to see any use. And honestly, not many elementals can charm or frighten anyway, to be honest. And once again, at level 14, you have another super situational feature. Beasts and plants have to succeed on a wisdom save when they try to attack you, and if they fail, they lose that attack or they have to attack someone else. Well, there aren't any beasts of CR 9 or above in D&D, so you really shouldn't be fighting any at this point in the game, and the highest CR plant is the Tree Folk, which you're also kind of way above dealing with by level 14. And even then, if the target succeeds on this saving throw even once, they are immune to the effect for the next 24 hours. This is a feature that should have been a core druid feature that they got at like level seven. This should not be the final feature of the baseline for everybody druid subclass. All in, the land druid gets off to a decent start, but then falls off really hard. Like it is not an exaggeration to say that in the wrong campaign, it's like playing without a subclass beyond level two. The level two ability does keep them out of D tier, but ironically for the land druid, they go at the bottom of the sea. Circle of the moon. Shh, can you hear that? It's the sounds of a thousand fanboys screaming that this is the best subclass in the game. And look, I kind of get it. The Moon Druid gets the iconic combat wild shape feature, letting you assume more powerful forms when you wild shape. The idea is that you're going to be fighting as a bear just as often as you do the more iconic druid stuff. 
This feature starts off as actually broken. Being a CR1 brown bear at level 2 puts you so far ahead than anyone else in the game in terms of power. And you can turn into it twice per long rest. You are way tankier, you are hitting way harder, it's just crazy. Sixth level is very simple. It lets your wild shape melee attacks count as magical to overcome damage resistances. Level 10 gives your wild shapes a big boost in power up from CR3 beasts at this level to CR5 elementals. All of these are powerful, but notably the earth elemental is basically a bonus action, gain 126 hit points and a 30 foot burrow speed. Finally, your level 14 feature is much more roleplay focused, letting you cast the spell Alter Self at will without a spell slot. It's not terrible, but it's not good. It generally completes the Moon Druid arc of being overpowered busted in the early game and then falling off as the game goes on. Still, the Moon Druid can wild shape infinitely from level 20, giving you essentially a rechargeable 126 hit points every single turn for a bonus action. You just keep turning into an earth elemental over and over again. Okay, so these guys definitely dip in power across the middle of the game, but the obscene power in the early and very late game, plus the fun factor of kicking ass as a bear, put these guys in S tier. Circle of the Shepherd. Last but not least, we get the circle of summoning so many goddamn wolves it looks like FurryCon09 in here. Yeah, so Circle of the Shepherd is the summoning D&D subclass, which, because many of the summoning spells are kind of problematic, gives this whole subclass a real it's complicated vibe. Level two Speech of the Woods gives you the Sylvan language and lets you basically always have the speak with animal spells online. It's, it's good roleplay, you got there, Buster. The real feature is the level two spirit totem, letting you summon a spirit that buffs all your allies in a 30 foot radius and all your future summons as well. The bear spirit drops temporary hit points like Skrillex drops beats a lot. The Hawk lets you use your reaction to give advantage to an ally's attack roll and gives everyone advantage on perception checks and the Unicorn gives everyone in its aura a little bit of passive healing whenever you cast a healing spell. Obviously all of these are good for your allies but the bear in particular is amazing when you combine it with a summoning spell because you are dropping around 80 temporary hit points on top of the eight wolves you just summoned with conjure animals. Those are some thick wolves, and they're only getting thicker because from level six, any beast or fey you summon comes in with an extra two hit points per hit die it has. Their weapon attacks are also considered magical for the purpose of overcoming any resistances. This is a good point to stop and note that this whole subclass is basically built around the spells Conjure Animals and Conjure Woodland Beings. These two spells are optimized when you use them to summon the maximum amount of creatures possible and they are famous for slowing games down. I am not going to punish this subclass's ranking because of these spells. The problem is, is with the spells, it's not the subclass's fault but there is a reason that there's been no mass summoning spells published since 2016. They're kind of busted strong, they make your turn take forever, they are a nightmare for the DM to keep track of, and they turn combat into a meat grinder. Anyway, your 10th level feature lets you turn combat into more of a meat grinder. You can now restore your summon's hit points every time they end their turn in your spirit's aura. The wolves keep getting thicker, people. Finally, you get maybe the funniest 14th level feature in the game. When you fall to zero hit points, you immediately get the benefits of the Conjure Animal spell cast at ninth level without concentration, summoning CR2 beasts. This is quite powerful, but mostly it's just funny that anytime you fall unconscious, four polar bears burst through the door and start smashing up the room. I mean, what can I say? This subclass takes one of the most powerful things in the game, summoning spells, and makes them way better. In terms of power, it is amazing. In terms of fun, 
you need to be very careful not to slow the game down. I think they belong in S tier, but maybe check out my video on game breaking low level spells if you want to use this in a way that doesn't just destroy your DM's sanity. Also remember to swing on by the Patreon, where we just dropped a subclass I've been wanting to make for years, the Great Worm Dragon Patron Warlock. They let you convert your attack roll based spells into a burst breath weapon attack once per turn. Yes, you can breath weapon your Eldritch Blast. It is honestly baffling that a Dragon Patron Warlock has never been made officially, but you know, here one is. Everyone who joins today also gets 150 plus pages of bonus content completely for free and you support the channel all on Patreon. Anyway, remember to like and subscribe, check out other videos on the channel. Here's the completed Druid tier list so you can see it all together. And yeah, that's basically all I got. See you next time.